My name is Thomas Krauss. I'm a cloud architect in the Global Technology Solutions Group at VMware. Um, with me up on stage is Chris Knowles. Hi, uh, like Thomas, uh, I'm a cloud architect within GTS at VMware. Uh, I'm at Shug Knowles, but my mom calls me Chris. <laughs> uh. So uh, just as a reward for everyone showing up on the last day in an afternoon session, you've, uh, you've just walked into a very interesting thing here. We're going to do a live whiteboard and take some requirements from the audience and build out a cloud interactively uh, on an overhead tool that's called Paper Show. So as we go through this process, we're going to hopefully try and give you guys kind of some boilerplate um, design practices that we use in the field uh, as we kind of build out infrastructure as a service clouds. So the way this is going to go is Chris is going to draw, and I'm going to kind of talk, hopefully, and fill up, fill up time while he's drawing. <laughs> so how many people here have experience or keyboard time with vCloud Director? Excellent. How, out of that group, how many of you are responsible for architecting? Or design, great. Perfect. So you're going to sit back after this and go, wow, that was like the best session ever. Or you're going to go, those guys really crashed and burned, and I was there when those two <laughs> guys tried to, to pull off this weird session at VMworld. So what we want to do is uh, first, really, you know, cloud is all about applications. And in the context of vCloud Director, we deploy vApps. So let's look at. Uh, from a vApp context, really what it is and you know, what can we do with, with a vApp as far as networking and security and reproducibility of that vApp itself. You know, how can I do things in a way that when I deploy and deploy and deploy, I don't have to reconfigure everything inside of that application just to be able to, just to, be or able to reinstantiate it uh, another time. So this is, we're going to talk about a vApp here, if I could learn how to write. Uh, in, so a vApp is a, essentially one or more virtual machines. And we containerize those into a vApp, and that's effectively the envelope that holds the VMs themselves. We can also attach to that vApp uh, things like key value pairs. Um, you can programmatically store, and also in the user interface of VCD, uh, metadata that you want to be attached to that vApp. It might be policy information. It might be notes to somebody. It might be uh, data that you want to pull out as part of some automation that's going to take next steps on that vApp when it's actually deployed. One of the use cases for this is um, maybe an org VDC that's offering a service, like an extra level of availability. You can have the vApps that get deployed into that org VDC actually require, with this key value pair, um, maybe high availability. And we can do a pattern match between the org VDC metadata and the metadata in the vApp and either using blocking tasks or some other mechanism, stop that deployment if that pattern match doesn't happen correctly. This is a new, uh, metadata tagging is new and I think in 1.5, right, Chris? Uh, yeah, 1.5 has uh, key value pair metadata tagging. It's exposed as something you can do in the user interface in 5.1. It wasn't something that you could do GUI in 1.5. You had to do it programmatically through the vCloud API. So Chris is building a, a private network, a vApp network, isolated vApp network between two virtual machines. Um, this looks like a web and a database multi-tier application. And so effectively the vApp, we have the notion of uh, private vApp networks. These are layer two networks that are wholly isolated to that vApp. So if we were to have this from our service catalog, which we'll talk about in a second, and redeploy another instance of this, inside of that, we're going to have that network exist as well. And when we do that, this network here and this network here are effectively in the context of the VMs. They see it as the same network, so we don't have to re-IP or do anything like that. But in the context of one vApp to the next, they're completely isolated. There's no communication that takes place. If someone does a layer two broadcast, they're not going to see each other. It doesn't exist. It's fully privatized uh, to that vApp. And so it allows us to deploy these things over and over again, you know, in this context, our web tier VM, we have an IP address of 10.1.100. And when we deploy another instance, it's going to stay 10.1.1.100. And so we don't have to reconfigure any of the software stack to, say, bind to a new uh, IP address on a NIC because it's the, the same IP address. What we do is we re-IP on the border of the application or where our ingress traffic comes from 
so that we can find this as a new V app. But once it gets into the V app, it stays the same, so our application itself didn't have to be uh, repersonaed and become something different and have to deal with all of the configuration tasks associated with that. The constructs that make this possible are the, are the vApp as an object inside vCloud Director and network pools. So we have this concept of hierarchical ne network relationships in vCloud Director. So we're going to take that vApp network, um, a discrete vApp <coughs> network will be spun up when we clone that, but we define a new relationship or plugging it into a new parent object of an org VDC network. Uh, and as Chris said, we can define new firewall rules, new NAT relationships with a new public IP address. And as long as we're updating publicly facing information like DNS and name registration, they can still get into that same machine. So before we go on to the next kind of picture of what we're going to build out here, are there any questions about vApps? Anybody doing stuff with vApps and they want to know maybe they had a challenge with it or anything like that? Uh, throw anything at us, vApp related? So the question was, vCloud Director, I assume it has an IP pool. How are those IPs assigned out, and how does that get decremented? Absolutely. So when you create a network in vCloud Director, you assign it a range of IPs. They can be contiguous, or if you have, you know, maybe you had some bad IP management in the past, and you have kind of holes in your, uh, your subnet, you can apply blocks of IPs and ranges. And then as vCloud Director assigns those, they can be given to the VM, and when you assign them, you can either say, I own that IP address until I explicitly release it, or you can say, I've got this IP address, but if I uh, you know, power down, someone else may come along and take that IP from me. So you have control over whether they're explicitly dedicated to a VM or not, and how they're doled out. Um, because this is a private network, that IP range is private to the V app. So when we create that vApp network, it's going to assign IP addresses to it. And when we deploy a new instance of that vApp, it's effectively going to create a brand new IP pool of the exact same IP subnet and range because it's associated with the vApp. So we can overlap those in the context of a vApp, just not in the context of the organization. So the, the, depending on what type of network pool you, you use, um, the layer two isolation happens automatically. Configuring the layer three information for that network um, is usually, depending whether it's a vApp or an org network, something that you do on the fly. But as Chris said, if it's isolated, it doesn't matter. The other thing to be concerned with is where are you getting the public addresses for this? So hierarchical relationship, if I'm doing this at the org VDC layer in 5.1, we don't have this concept of organization networks anymore. We have org VDC networks. The parent network there is an external network. We can't connect to the physical world without going through an external network. So we need to define a range of IP addresses on that external network that can then be pulled for things like vShield Edge devices that are going to be protecting that organization network, because they need external connectivity. Yeah. And so, you control that, and that decrement and increment happens automatically as things are freed up. So why don't we take that network, and we'll build out that whole picture so you can see it in full context. So we have our vApp. I won't draw it all out in detail this time, since uh, we just looked at it. We can go back a page and refer to it if we need to. So we have our VMs in that, and we had our vShield Edge device on that. So we have our vApp that we're going to be running in our cloud, and that's our workload. And the vApps get deployed to what's called an organization virtual data center, which is effectively a way that we assign capacity to our tenant. So that vApp sits inside of, what's a good color, red? Okay, Our org VDC. And that org VDC, we'll build this out in a second, but it's effectively the underlying resources that we sell up to our tenant that come from this shared pool of capacity. So this org VDC is ultimately coming from what's called a provider VDC. So we make that one blue. Can everybody see this okay? Like, is the, am I drawing big enough? Is it good? Okay. So this is our provider VDC. And our org VDC is a hunk of capacity from this provider VDC. It might be all of it. It might just be some of it. And this is where we differentiate how we give the resources to our tenant. 
And we have three ways of doing that. You can do a pay-as-you-go model where we don't explicitly assign anything to you. We just say, as you deploy new workloads, we will dedicate resources to those workloads. And at the provider layer, we just run out of space until it's gone. And we can you know, elastically add more if we need to. And then, or we can do things like reservation pool, where we say, here is 100 gigahertz of CPU. Here's 100 gigabytes of RAM. It's all yours. You're going to start paying for it now. But because we give it all to you, we'll let you as the tenant have control over how you allocate the resources to your applications. So I might have 100 gig of RAM, and I might deploy only 100 gig of RAM worth of VMs because I want no overcommitment. Or I might say, well, I'm going to deploy 400 gig of RAM worth of VMs because I'm okay with a four to one memory commit. You know, I've got transparent page sharing and uh, memory compression, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I know my workloads are going to behave as I need them to. Or if you do allocation pool based uh, resource allocation to the end user in the org VDC, they have no ability to overcommit. I give them that 100 gig. When they try and deploy that 101st gig of RAM, the cloud goes, sorry, you're not allowed to. You only get 100 gig. And myself as the provider, I've said, well, in my cloud, I know I can overcommit my tenants. So I'm actually going to say in that 100 gig, there's really 400 gig of RAM across all my tenants. And I control the overcommitment rates of, of my capacity. How many people design like this from the application down as opposed from the infrastructure up? OK. I think we, Chris and I, both also have a tendency to start at the infrastructure layer. And when you get to the cloud world, you really need to be concerned about the application and the application requirements. Uh, everything from networking to storage profiles now in 5.1, you really want to be concerned about the discrete needs of those applications um, and see how that relates to capacity management, your network design, your storage design. So we'll, that, that's what we've decided to do here. So inside of our organization, which we live in, which is really the, the containerization of a tenant, it's where role-based access control is framed around, it's where my tenant's capacity lives, it's how I build out my isolation barriers between tenants. Our organization, in this context, we have two org VDCs. We have our vApp running in one. We can have organization networks that our vApp is going to connect to in order to be able to communicate outside of the cloud. So this org network has an IP pool, which is going to be some subnet and range. It's going to have you know, a default gateway. It might have DNS services. And, and any time a vApp or any construct inside of my organization connects to that, it's that org network that was pre-built by the cloud provider that's going to say, oh, you want to connect to me? Here's an IP address that I will give you. And it will take it out of that pool, and then that IP address is no longer available for anybody else until that vApp releases it, and then it becomes back a part of the pool, and another tenant can consume that IP address. So if you look at the design of the product, right, this feature is put in there for a specific reason, not because it's cool. Network pools enable self-service. So you as the provider can dictate how many networks are available, how you're going to isolate those networks at layer two, um, and make those configuration changes ahead of time. And then your consumer can simply consume those in a self-service manner without worrying about all the complexities of uh, layer two isolation, VLAN, switch tagging, trunking. So we have two tenants in this context. We have two organization networks. These are transit networks that my workloads want to be able to actually get outside of the cloud to be able to communicate with an end user on their mobile device or their desktop or some other web service. So these org networks are effectively backed by, at the provider layer, an external network. It's some network that if we were to go down to our vSphere layer, this external network is really just it's a port group on some DVS inside of vSphere. And then that DVS port group is actually connected to some physical network. So if we were to look at these two org networks and they're connected back to our external network, what's, what's the problem with this? 
So the problem is, if I have another V app sitting over here, and it's connecting back to this network, this V app on the left and this V app on the right, they are on the same layer two network at the external network layer. So I have two different tenants. I have, you know, um, company A and company B, and they don't get along and they're suing each other, and they should never be on each other's corporate networks. In this context, if they deploy that V app, they will be. So what we need to do is when we deploy these networks, between the organization and our external network, we automatically deploy vShield Edge devices, and we end up with firewalls between our organization automatically. We don't have to go and build these firewalls. We can just, when we create the networks, instantiate them, and these firewalls will be in place. And then we effectively have a security border on our organization for any communication in and out of that. And to get from one org to another, we have to have some kind of firewall ruling that would allow us to actually talk to each other. Yeah, by default, IP masquerading is enabled, so those machines inside that org network, if, they were, if it was a NAT routed org network, would be able to get outbound traffic, but nothing would be allowed in by default until you define a discrete NAT rule or a routing configuration for that edge device. How many people here are familiar with the edge changes that are exposed in 5.1 inside vCloud Director? Okay, so one of the things we had in the past was a, uh, maybe an overabundance of edge devices deployed, depending on how many uh, NAT routed relationships you had. Um, in 5.1, uh, because of changes at the underlying um, uh, vShield layer, we actually allow you to create what's called a multi-home vShield edge device, and we can actually protect multiple networks as long as they're in the same organization with the same edge device. So it's more like a traditional router, a traditional firewall, traditional, traditional Juniper device. Um, we can also configure that edge device for high availability, um, different sizing. It's, not, it's no longer one size fits all, where you've got a, a static vShield edge device that can't be changed. We can change the size of that machine and essentially change the amount of connections it's able to handle. So the, our provider VDC, where we allocated that capacity up to our tenant, Effectively, what a provider VDC is, is metadata that consolidates and encapsulates resource pools from underlying vSphere resources. And these can be multiple clusters of the same type of capacity that are managed by completely different virtual centers. And then we can aggregate those into a single chunk of capacity to allow us to give us you know, a much larger resource pool than what can be delivered by a single cluster or managed by a single virtual center and we expose that up to our tenants as this you know, homogenous clump of capacity without having to manage it as discrete VCs and discrete resource pools. And so in this context, we just have two clusters, each under a different VC, but once we group that together, we can manage it as just a single pool of capacity. So if I was looking at this and the next logical, th next logical step might be storage, I'd be thinking to myself, so. Technically, a data center is a vMotion boundary, right? But we're not going to vMotion between different clusters. So essentially, those clusters need to be presented the same LUNs or the same NFS data stores so that we can, DRS can operate between those compute pools. Um, the way we do that is actually building, in 5.1, we have this concept of being able to build storage clusters now. So DRS can still continue to function, but we can tier our storage a little differently so we could have high performance uh, fiber channel drives, maybe for the database system that's got a, a heavy uh, you know, I.O. profile for heavy writes, and then maybe a SATA tier for the other workloads that don't necessarily need a tremendous amount of storage performance. So what we can do is we can create storage profiles and storage capabilities against our different storage types. And when we create these at the vSphere layer, and we pass them up to our provider virtual data center, these become capabilities of this provider virtual data center. So that way what we can do is when we sell that capacity to our tenant, we can offer them different classes of service because we're gonna have completely different storage profiles as far as IOPS or bandwidth. Um, and what happens is when I go to deploy a vApp, at the individual components within that vApps, in our two VM example, right, we had, uh, a web server and a database server. This web server, we might say, well, you're not very I.O. intensive, so 
all I really need for you is the bronze level of storage. And for our database, we are actually I.O. intensive, so I need the gold tier of storage. And when I, and when I actually go and deploy my vApp into the cloud, what's going to happen is that web VM is going to end up landing on my SATA storage, and my database VM is going to end up landing on my SSD storage. And now as a tenant of that cloud, I don't have to know or care what's happening at the physical infrastructure or the virtualized infrastructure layer. All I have to know is, hey, there's this thing I can buy called gold storage that's going to give me a certain level of service to my workload, and I need that for my database. And I know there's this bronze level of storage that is going to give me lower performance, but my web server's not I.O. intensive on the storage, just on the network, so I'd rather pay less for that storage for that particular VM, and that gets stored with the vApp. And when I go and deploy that vApp to add a new web app to my organization so I can build a new marketing service or whatever it may be, I just deploy that, and it's going to find the right home, and I'm going to just consume and pay for the capacity that makes sense based on the needs of that actual application. So a lot of that information is bubbled up from vSphere, yeah? Yeah, so within a vApp, or uh, sorry, within a VM, we don't today do differentiated disks in a VM. It's at the VM layer. So the VM gets deployed to a storage level, right? You so, can't do no, storage right. profiles on a per disk. So if you have two VM DKs VM. for a virtual machine inside a vApp, you can't differentiate uh, different tiers for those virtual disks. Um, the same rules apply. So performance characterization of workloads still apply. If you have to make a choice, I would err on the side of more performance, and you're going to have to probably pay a price for your database system sitting on RAID 1 storage or high-performance storage. Yep. Uh, very good question. We're, we're drawing. Repeat the question for the. I'm sorry. So the question was, we're showing two no networks. Is that a single IP pool or multiple IP pools? And sometimes the terminology gets confusing. We're pulling from the same pool, but that's separate instances that got instantiated from the pool. OK? Yeah. No, no remember, it's, it's a layer two isolation. So you're defining what that layer three configuration is, if it's an organ administrator that's spinning up that network. I'm sorry, that's actually going to be a provider, provider administrator spinning up that network. It's going to pull from the pool, and as you create that org network, you're going to have to determine what that layer three information is, you as the provider. An org administrator can tweak those settings and make changes to the firewall, um, but the layer three information gets configured by you, the provider, at the time you instantiate it. So it's really... The pool is actually layer two isolation. That's really what it is. And the layer three information is inputted by you. So if we look at this context, at our external network layer, that external network has an IP pool associated with it because effectively that external network is a network that goes off outside of my cloud. So you know it's my corporate LAN and it's 172.16.1, whatever. So I give a pool of IPs to that. When I create the org network, if I do not put a vShield Edge device on it, it inherits that pool because it's the same network. But when I put a vShield Edge device on it, I'm effectively creating a brand new layer two network that's isolated by that Edge device. So that network then gets its own IP pool, and they can be the same pools between organizations. So those could both be 10.1.1. whatever. Uh, or they could be different. It's really up to the organization at that point to number however they want to based on their need. Did that answer the question okay? Okay, perfect. One thing that's probably becoming apparent is the networking concepts inside VCD are extremely powerful and sometimes can be misconstrued as extremely complicated. Um, that from a provider standpoint, right, we're adding complexity to simplify the consumer's life, but there's four or five different ways we can do a lot of different things from a networking perspective inside vCloud Director. 
So all of this here, our, our vSphere layer, where we have our resources as cluster capacity, we have our networks that are just effectively DVSs, and we abstract those up into provider concepts and then things we give out to our tenants. That effectively is, you know, if we go back to the V app picture we had before and we put it small, this is that, this is the cloud. Okay, so if we then say that's our cloud, on this drawing, that is all of that stuff. And so let's, let's look at some of the things we can do from a hybrid cloud standpoint. And when we say hybrid cloud, we're talking about a private internal cloud and some public resources that are not our and we, ours. We don't own those. They're resources that uh, we're paying for from somebody else in order to just rent or consume based on our business need and give back when we don't want. What we can do is, and even in our private cloud, we probably still have some traditional vSphere environment in here, uh, and we might have some physical stuff. It's, it's not cloud only, right? The first thing we want to do is we want to be able to move workloads from one place to another in order to take advantage of each of these different locations. And so I'll give you a real world example that we did with a gaming company. They basically develop their games internally and they're on vSphere, the VMs running the games. And they have a large number of game testing studios that they need to scale out their games to have you know, hundreds of users doing QA during a QA cycle. And when they're done that QA cycle, they don't need those resources anymore. But what they were doing is they were building to fit the large scale of all those gaming testers. So it's a lot of resources they have to put on their data center floor and pay for that sit there idle most of the time. Great opportunity for cloud. The second piece was for those QA testers to get in, they would actually give VPN access to their data center to effectively untrusted third party that you know you have a QA tester sitting at a desk and he goes, hey, I got an IP into some data center. They might snoop around and get malicious or whatever. And you have to build additional security controls in to ensure that the people coming into your data center are gonna stay constrained to where they need to live. So we wanted to get rid of those needs of more capacity than I need most of the time and having to give them actual network access to my data center. So the way we did that was we use a product called vCloud Connector. And vCloud Connector knows how to talk to vSphere. It knows how to talk to your private cloud, and it knows how to talk to your public cloud. And we have our game running as a VM or a set of VMs, let's say, in our traditional vSphere environment. And, and they wanted to, using a bad term, cloudify those VMs and move them in. So vCloud Connector allows you to take those VMs and move them into your private cloud with more or less a couple of clicks. I mean, there are things you might have to do. Your networking may change because now we're moving from two different environments. There's things you can do to make sure they don't have to change, but uh, you effectively are able to move that game now as a vApp into a private cloud. They can then, having that in the private cloud, do whatever work they need to do in there from a build cycle of the game itself. And then that what we did was we took that game and we migrate it to the public cloud. And then we deploy it on mass and only pay for those games while we need them because our cloud provider is giving us a pay as you go opportunity to just say, okay, well, you run these and you do your QA cycle. Uh, you pay for it when you destroy them. There's no cost because you're not consuming anything anymore. And all those QA testers that we have, they get assigned their own game stack and they're running and doing their QA in the public cloud, and we no longer have any connectivity back into my corporate data center in order to give access to those game testers. So they can't do anything malicious at this point. There is no access, so we're clean and clear on that. Different, what kind of companies? So um, service like providers or, or actually? No, not today. Yeah, no, in this context, it, we were using, um, <coughs> who was the, I think it was Colt was the provider, and they're a vCloud provider. That of, we consumed their vCloud service. But in the, yeah, in this context, we're talking about vCloud directors, provide, powered providers. Um, a, we have a program called VCDC, and what that does is allow you to build hybrid clouds like this. 
and it specifies basically the way that the public service provider is going to offer their cloud services so that it's a consistent look and feel. Um, it specifies what API portions need to be available, what ports for data movement. So it basically enables if you go to a VCDC partner, you're assured that you're going to be able to do things like this. You're going to be able to write your own portal and make API calls into that organization. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a framework that allows us to do things like this. But it's powered on vCloud Director. So, so once they've finished a QA cycle, they can take all those games or the ones they need and they can migrate them back into their private cloud to do any additional work they need to and they can deploy them en masse within their cloud in a self-service fashion in order for their internal users to interact and consume those games that were out for QA. And then when they go to production, you know, cloud is a relatively new thing, especially for production applications. So your processes and you know, you've got your run books and your help desk and your operations, they all know how to run production apps in vSphere, but they may not be familiar with how to run them in the cloud from a you know, troubleshooting and day-to-day uh, -day operation standpoint. And once you're in production, you don't want to take risk. You're monetizing these at this point. And so you want to do things the way you know and you're comfortable and figure out all those operational procedures over time and then do production in the cloud. But until you get to that state, we can then take that game and we can run it on traditional vSphere without any of the implications of being in the cloud at that point. So they would then destage from the private cloud back to traditional vSphere and run in production, and then their operational policies and procedures are effectively unchanged. So what about connectivity? So we have this private cloud and we have this public cloud. In this case, we didn't have to have any bidirectional communication amongst the systems within those clouds, but there are a lot of cases where you do. You might have um, your back-end resources in your private data center, and then have, for scale, an example would be uh, running computationally intensive jobs out in the cloud in order to reduce your compute time. We did a project with a customer that had, internally they had 40 VMs that did computation on a data set for about two and a half days, and then it would produce the end results. And that two and a half day window, they wanted to onboard new customers into the data set, but they can't because two and a half days is all they've got to get the work done. So they could move the computationally intensive side of the task to the cloud and run 300 VMs instead of 40 and reduce their compute time to hours instead of days. And then once that computational cycle completes, they can power them off and destroy them, and they don't have to pay for them. So it effectively ends up costing the same as having the resources to run those 40, but you actually have a lot more, and you get more done in less time. So we needed to be able to communicate between those clouds. So the way that works is actually pretty easy to do. So we have two clouds. We have our private cloud and our public cloud. And we talked about a few slides back having org networks where this organization and that organization aren't able to communicate with each other. So in our public and private model, we have two separate organizations. They're the same, I'm the same company, but they're different clouds. So I have an org here and I have an org there. And inside of those, we have org networks. So j just to reiterate, what we showed in the previous slide was the ability to administratively uh, connect two clouds and move workloads between them. Uh, we can take some limited administrative action on those vApps in the public cloud using vCloud Connector. What Chris is going to show here is actually connecting them at the application layer. So that's two different things. We can do them together if you want, but what he's going to show is actually being able to talk from one vApp inside your internal network to a vApp inside the public cloud provider. Um, and I'll let him explain the feature that allows us to do that. There are some caveats and configuration elements that you need to provide on your physical firewalls to be able to do this. Um, but I just want to make sure that's clear. So as an organization administrator within the cloud, what I can do is I can say, I have an organization in this cloud. I have an organization in this cloud. They have networks. I need them to talk to each other. So as long as I have credentials as an org administrator, I can go in and say, bind these two networks together. And what happens is all of the heavy lifting that a network admin would normally have to do gets uh, turned into putting in your username and password and specifying the networks. 
and we'll automatically create an IPsec VPN tunnel between these two networks, and we'll effectively create a routing path to be able to talk from one to another. So I can have in my uh, routing table, knowing this org network is, uh, let's say this was uh, 10.1.1.100, or I guess X. And this is uh, 172.16. So this is a requirement. This is not an option. The way the IPsec VPN tunnel works inside vShield Edge is it's based on interesting traffic, just like a standard VPN device. Um, so those subnets do have to be different, otherwise the traffic will not be sent over the tunnel. And so effectively all we have to do is say, over here, if we want to talk some VM to some VM, if you want to talk to 172, uh, here we just have our default gateway be either this firewall device in the one cloud here, or we have a rule in our routing table that says, if you need to talk to the VM on the other side, go to this gateway here. And then the traffic will be directed across to the other cloud, and that VM will then find its uh, neighbor on the other side of that layer three network. And we don't have to do any of the setup on that. It's simply saying, I want this network to be able to see this network in these two clouds. Here's my credentials, click, 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 and you'll have the connectivity between those two networks. The other thing we're not showing here, which is another feature, is we can actually do this between a corporate environment that supports the same encryption protocols into our vShield Edge device. So you could have a, essentially a site to org um, a VPN tunnel, IPsec VPN tunnel. So if you have a Juniper device that supports uh, SHA encryption and the same protocols that we use, and we get that pre-shared key, we can configure that and interesting traffic out of that entire site or branch office could be routed into an org network in the public service provider. So when we build our cloud, there's a lot of things. That's basic infrastructure as a service, everything we've done. We haven't done any integration at that point, but there's a lot of cases where you want to or need to do integration because we don't have just cloud. We have external DNS services. We have CMDBs. We have other authentication systems. We have logging. We have financial, you know, systems. financial systems. There's all kinds of things that you have as external touch points you need to be able to interact with. And, and we have a lot of ways that we can actually interact with those. And what becomes the core tenant of that is using a message queuing layer in order to give you this decoupled polyglot access layer that I can then, in any language I want to, write connections to consume those messages and go interact wherever I need, whether it be Java, C++, .NET, or using orchestrator to consume those messages and go do what I need to do. So vCloud Director, the cell, is effectively the engine of a vCloud. It's the thing that does all the work of instantiation and management and configuration of the cloud itself. It's, it is the cloud from a, which component makes my cloud do stuff? That's the VCD cell. So the cell itself, what we're able to do is we have an AMQP exchange And we use, in our context, RabbitMQ. But you could use any AMQP-compliant queuing service. I don't know if it does, but if, you know, like Microsoft Messaging Services understands AMQP messages, you could use that. If you could, you could use IBM MQ if it does it. I, I don't know, but uh, we, in our case, use RabbitMQ. So anytime something happens in this cloud, I deploy, excuse me, I deploy a new vApp. Sorry about that. So when I actually go and deploy this, what happens is the VCD cell sends a message to the configured exchange that says a new vApp was deployed. So I now have a notification that's gone out that said something happened in my cloud. And then I can have an external system, whether it's VCO or uh, something I've written as my own service, go and take that message process it, and then do work with it. So this might be update a CMDB. It might be update DNS. It might be anything I need to do. This is basically, I'm going to advertise as a cloud. I did something. I need to integrate when something happens with something else. This is the path that the integration takes. 
that's just one way, right? There's no interaction back with the action that created that message. It's purely just saying, hey, this happened. So what we want to be able to do is add on to that and actually cause change or interact with the action that created the message. So we can do what's called a blocking task rather than just notifying on this. And I can specify when I build out my cloud and say, any time a vApp is deployed or whatever action you want to do this for, do the action or at least start the action, send out a message that this is going to happen, but then just sit there waiting. And so that deploy never occurs. It just sits there and goes, okay, I've been asked to deploy a vApp, but I'm going to sit there and wait. And so when we actually get that message, so the message comes out, uh, we go and we do our work, the work can say, no, don't allow that, or yes, that was okay. And if we say it's okay, we then send a, essentially a call back to our cloud and say, let's resume on that. Or let's fail that out. And it allows us to, based on the work we do, which is go get a help desk ticket or update Remedy or ServiceNow and get someone to permit that or make sure that there's a license key or that finance has funding to pay for that VM, I can then come back and say, yep, that was good, let it happen, resume that vApp deploy and it'll continue on. Or you can say, no, I, you don't have the resources or the justification for what you need to do, let's fail that and we'll just send a notice to the user that says, okay, we fail. So a good use case for the first one, which is the passive notifications, is log um, separation by org, right? Because we pass some information back to VCO or the third-party system. Part of that information is the organization ID, so we can then separate those logs. And VC VCD will continue to do what it needs to do. Um, what Chris just described here, another great use case, so we're, now we're talking about blocking tasks, um, passing out based on a user-initiated action inside our portal. So you want to use the portal. You want to execute an action inside vCloud Director, but there's one more thing you want to do to insert into that process of vApp instantiation, or you want to change the vApp instantiation. So reaching out to Infoblox, pulling an IP address, um, canceling the original task, and then starting a new task where the vApp gets deployed with the correct IP address is a very common use case. So what about actually adding new services to their cloud? Basic IIS, what we talked about, I want to differentiate that. My end user needs uh, database as a service. They need storage as a service. They need load balancing as a service. They need uh, ordering widgets as a service. Whatever it may be that I need to differentiate my service offering on, how, how can I actually build new capabilities into my infrastructure that don't exist as part of the products that it's built upon? And we do that through a new capability called API extensions that more or less works like our message passing here but its use case is completely different. What we do is traditionally, if I make a call to the vCloud API where I say deploy a vApp or tell me about an organization or whatever it may be, that call, it gets sent off to inside of the VCD product itself in the cell, a REST handler. And that's the code inside that says, okay, this call was made, these are the methods that were called, I know how to process that. It does something. It sends back the results. You know, it did the work here. It deployed a VM. It did whatever was supposed to happen. And then the results of that call are sent back to the end user. But if I wanted to, for example, create a brand new call to do, uh, what's, a, what's a service? Let's say we wanted to do... Load balancing. Uh, what's that? Load balancing as a service? Yeah, load balancing or storage as a service. I want to do... I, I make a call. Some org ID. Uh, let's say storage. So I, so I have this new call that I want to make. It doesn't exist. An organization doesn't have a call called storage. I don't have a service that my cloud offers called storage. So what I can do is I can register a definition of a new service that doesn't exist into the cell that says, if somebody makes a call to storage, you don't know what that is, but I do. So instead of the REST handler dealing with that, what happens is the cell sends that request to an AMQP message bus that's going to send in what's going to be a, a JSON 
message that's basically just uh, serialized objects of whatever the call that was made is. And then I can have my external service instead of my rest handler. And in this case, we're talking about our storage service. Get that message, do the work of provisioning storage or creating an iSCSI target or deploying an NFS volume or a SIF share, whatever it is. It goes and makes that new storage available. And then we return back from our external service a message that says, hey, I just completed what I was trying to get for you on that call. And then we, the cell takes that back and sends the results back to my end user. And what I've done is I've taken my vCloud environment and I've created storage as a service that didn't exist in the past. You could do something like uh, create database as a service. You're not going to build a huge RDBMS that you're going to call through the vCloud API. But you might just need basic table services for someone to do CRUD operations on where I just want to store stuff because I want to be able to access it through the web and it's part of an overall architecture where I need a repository for key value pairs or whatever it might be. I can create a brand new database as a service that I can attach to an organization or a vApp or whatever entity it needs to be associated with and then I can on my own implement something that's going to do the work of uh, doing you know, insert, update, delete statements against some table and passing that information back and forth to my user through the vCloud API doing something that vCloud doesn't know how to do. So you can build an integration with your cloud to do anything you need to do. And this is really powerful for people like service providers that want to offer differentiated services on top of simply vCloud Director. You can expose capabilities that don't exist as far as we did an example demo where fault tolerance, while this isn't supported in the product, we did it anyways, um, we did fault tolerance as a service against a vApp. vCloud Director doesn't do fault tolerance on vApps, but, so we made it do it. We created a new service called fault tolerance on a vApp, and when you call that as a user, we do the work of going behind the scenes and s turning on FT on the VMs that make up the vApp we call it on. So you can literally do anything. The only constraint to this is because it's a RESTful API, it's a, it's a request and a response, you're not going to do streaming services. So you couldn't do like video as a service and stream out a video stream over the vCloud API. But I mean, you probably wouldn't do that anyways. In the context of the previous two examples, right, if we, if we kind of conceptualize how this works, this is a lot, I won't say a lot, but this is more work effort to get this to work. But relative to blocking tasks, right, blocking tasks is kind of used for, I want to leverage vCloud Director's native capabilities, but I want to make one minor change to the way it does a vApp instantiation, or I want to make one minor tweak. And the time and development effort to make that change is relatively minimal. This is a lot more development, but obviously you can see it's a lot more payoff because you can pretty much add anything as a service to your cloud. Um, I'm not a development, I'm not a developer, and I did it with VCO, um, and it was fairly straightforward. Chris did it with Java, but the, it's an open architecture, so as long as you can subscribe and publish to AMQP and that third-party work service exposes a web services API, um, you can add anything. And if it's a VCO plugin, even better. So are there any questions at this point? Anyone want to dive into anything that we haven't talked about so far? Anything uh, you know, burning in your mind that you want to know about? Anything? Wow. Uh, session so far, format. Do you like the format of doing it as a whiteboard rather than killing you with PowerPoint? Show of hands if you do. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> we haven't done this at VMworld ever, and so it's, we were like, okay, maybe this will go great, or we're going to crash and burn. and. You're going to walk out of here going, that was a big waste of my time. So we're glad that you like the format. Anything you want to dive into? Um, no. I don't know how much time we have. Mm -hmm. Ten minutes. We have ten minutes. Yeah, we're at the Q&A part. Anybody have questions on what we've gone over? We went over a lot of information very quickly. Go ahead. If you could step up to the mic, they're really busting our chops about that. <laughs> <laughs> if you go back to uh, some of the previous slides where you were showing us uh, multiple organizations, multiple... Uh, you were showing us external network, et cetera. Keep going, keep going. There, there you go, perfect. All right, if I'm an external, uh, an external provider, um, you know, I need to do backups and monitoring and stuff like that. I need to be able to connect my network, my service network, to all of my customers' networks. Right. 
how does it look like? Like an external network uh, pool like you have it in there? Just another one? Or how does that look like? So, so it sounds like the question is, um, I need to provide additional services to each of the VMs inside of VApp as the service provider. How do I get network connectivity into those VMs? Yep. Okay. And it looks like Chris is going to whiteboard that. You want me to talk while you're... Talk while okay. Do. So you're right. I think you said multiple external networks. Yeah, today that's the way you would do that. So depending whether you want to... It's probably better to do an external network and then a direct connect org network back into either a VApp that's not fenced or there's multiple ways to skin the cat. But essentially, to provide that layer two isolation, you're going to end up with separate uh, external networks. And so that means, well, that means I need to put a new vShield, an additional vShield to that network? You don't necessarily. So, well. so in the context of your question, so here we have some physical network that's a port group in vSphere that goes to some external network, then up to an org. Where does your monitoring sit in this picture? On that external network, or is it a cloud service you're offering as far as monitoring goes? Well, uh, that's what I'm asking. So right now, today, you know, if a person is just doing colo, we ask him for a port in their server. Uh, if a person is doing, uh, you know, if they're just having, like a, having us manage vSphere, we set up each machine with two little virtual ports, and we connect them out to our infrastructure. But this is a private network to manage, uh, I don't know, let's say we're managing net, net backup. Or let's say we're managing uh, exchange or something like that as a service. I need connectivity to my tools network. Are you isolating with VLANs or is it physically isolated? The, the well, network? today is physical. Physical um, isolation? Today. But, okay. you know, this is cloud, so okay. it should so let's, be. Let's look at that. So exchange running up here. Uh, actually, a perfect example, do net backup instead. I know we wouldn't back up from the guest, but that's a good example. Do which? Net backup. So. Okay, so we have, so net backup down here. Yeah, I just do that one. It's a lot easier. <laughs> I know. So if we're doing in get, let's let's not look at doing vSphere backup in this picture. Let's look at in guest backup just for the first that context my of point. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have net backup sitting down here on our network somewhere. Some of my colleagues in the front row they kind of just shuddered to think that I have to go through this right now. <laughs> well, it's actually physically isolated. So right? it's it's not too bad. So net backup down here, let's say this is on 10.1.100. Let's say this is uh, 172.1.50. Okay, so how do we go from our MBU get, uh, agent up on that VM and get our backup server to talk to that? In the simplest form, if you're a private cloud, you could have an external network that's just for backup, and you could have a second NIC on this VM that's the backup network. Like a lot of times you'll build a backup network, right, to isolate Perfect. bandwidth and stuff. You could do that. If you need isolation of networks, you can have the net backup server, because in this case, excuse me, we're just talking about direct routing. This firewall device here can just be a router. And we can have a routing rule in whatever the gateway of our net backup server is that says to find 172.16.1, this is the default gateway of that network, and this is how you get there. Um, if, if you need any other isolation, you can still build that in. You really, it's just a matter of routing. You just have to be able to route to those endpoints. All right, but the question was, do I need a separate vShield? We had one vShield for a external network to go out to the internet, for example, in your original diagram. If I make another external network for backup, do I need a separate vShield per org? So the, the question is, does he need a separate vShield from the, for the backup network? Yep. Not necessarily, right? We can, you can bridge layer two right from that connection into that port group right okay. up to a, a vApp network, essentially. Uh, that plugs into that VM that's using that same layer three information that's on your physical network. So awesome. you don't need the vShield Edge device in that case. Perfect. Thank and you. it actually gets even cooler now with VXLAN because this network up here, this could be a VXLAN network. And so it's, it's tunneled across just some shared circuit. And down here, you could have something like an Arista switch. I don't even know if I'm going to spell this right. Is there two R's? No, that's it. Yeah, and, and so that switch, and there's other vendors that do this, it can act as a VXLAN gateway. So they have a, a hardware VTAP that they can do 
that's going to connect to this network and connect to this network and allow it to act as the VLAN, VXLAN transit. See, I like that better. I, I, I do like this better. Perfect. So, thank you. Yeah. Cool. You're welcome. Sure. Uh, any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, oh, please, we can just repeat please. it so you don't have to walk. Oh. Sure. Right. So we call yeah, we can site do that. to org. But Chris will, demo, Chris will show that. Do you want to start talking about it? Right, right. So when we talk about from an um, administrative standpoint, uh, relate it back to like a Juniper device, it's very, very easy. So you don't need to get involved with pre shared keys. That, that piece happens automatically. Um, as I said earlier, a VCDC partner, are we going to a public cloud? Public cloud, an Oregon a public cloud or an Oregon a enterprise? To, to where? You have, a, you have an app that you just want to have secured connectivity to. Yeah. Is the Oregon a public cloud or a private cloud? No, this is an Oregon their date. So. Okay. Okay. Yep, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so because vShield Edge is a IPsec VPN gateway, this client, as long as they have an IPsec client, and I mean, like, that's built into Windows, right? So they can do a client VPN connection to this org and get access to the network on there. And they'll, they'll be assigned an IP address on whatever network that that VPN endpoint drops them on. You could even do something like, if you wanted to not at the org level, but at the vApp level secure it, you could have on the vApp the edge device and they would VPN to the app instead of the org. So you could do either or. They would have to create VPN tunnels to each if you wanted to separate them. You could, you could if you wanted to. It'd be easier to build it where you trust the org, and if they get in the org, they have access to all the vApps and put them on the same network. But if you have security constraints that don't let you do that, they'd have to create separate tunnels to each. So ad administratively, all you need to set this up is org administrator privileges in the target organization. Um, and then you need to specify the network you want to connect to. At the network layer, you, de you do need to make sure the correct ports are open. I think it's 500 and a couple others to actually establish that tunnel. And that tunnel's not going to the cell, it's going to the vShield Edge device at that point. Um, you can do it uh, from the client like this, or you could even do it in a robo fashion where the Juniper device is configured with a, a VPN tunnel into the org, and based on interesting traffic for that target subnet that you're trying to hit, it will automatically send it across that tunnel, as long as it supports the encryption protocols that we support. Yeah. And we'll actually, all the drawings and stuff, we'll PDF them and they'll be made available as a download, like you can get all the other session stuff too, if you want to refer to any of this. That was what we never mentioned in the other any other questions, guys? Well, thanks for your time. We uh, yeah, really, really appreciate, appreciate it. it. And the interaction on the, the last day. Thank you very much.